All right. Well, welcome back, everyone. Um, let's get started on our afternoon program. I'm delighted to welcome Josh Mandel to, uh, to present this afternoon. Uh, Josh is a physician and software developer. Uh, I bet there are a few of those in the room here, or in, the, in the virtual room today. Uh, Josh is working on uh, to build an ecosystem of health apps with access to clinical and research data. Uh, he works at uh, Microsoft, where he serves as the chief architect for Microsoft Healthcare, and is also the chief architect for Smart Health IT. Uh, he also is a lecturer at Harvard Medical School's Department of Biomedical Informatics and works with Zach and his team. Um, Josh works closely with the uh, standards development community to, to lay the groundwork for frictionless data access authorization, analytics, and app integration. Uh, he led the development of the SMART specification and launched the Clinical Decision Support Hooks project. Um, interesting, I noticed in his, uh, in his LinkedIn profile, uh, when he was a student at MIT, he co-designed and implemented the world's first on-demand campus cable TV music service. So maybe we'll have a question about that as we uh, go through this. Uh, Josh has a degree from MIT in electrical engineering and computer science and uh, earned his MD at Tufts. Today, his title is gonna be FIRE, Interop for Consumer Access, Clinical Research, and Beyond. Josh, welcome. Thanks so much for the introduction and, and for the invitation to share uh, some thoughts with you this afternoon. Uh, I wanted to share a link to the deck, so I'll put this um, in the chat on Zoom, but also it'll be in the corner of the slide, so that's uh, bit.ly slash i2b2 hyphen jmandel. Uh, I'm happy to take questions uh, as, as we go through the talk. Uh, so feel free to raise your hand in Zoom if there's something um, that's sort of urgent or that, that's preventing you from following what's going on. Uh, also plan to leave time at the end for, for questions, but happy to keep this interactive if folks wanna engage in that way. Um, and what I've done is to put together basically just a collection of links that I'll try to take you on a tour through that tells the story of where we are today in the interoperability landscape to talk a bit about some of the technology and the standards, as well as some of the policies and the deployment challenges around developing and getting consistent support for those standards out in the ecosystem. And I'm gonna use two lenses to look at this. One is consumer access. So what does it take for individuals to get access to and manage their own clinical data for folks who wanna do that? Uh, and the other, end, the other lens is research. So what are the, the tools and technologies in place to help researchers make sense of uh, and, and do analyses of and, and bring research results back into clinical workflow? Uh, and then just a little bit looking ahead at what I, what I see as some of the persistent challenges in this space. So let's dig in on the first theme of, of consumer access. Uh, and I wanna say a few things, first of all, just about availability of healthcare data to consumers. And we've had a regulatory framework under HIPAA now for over 20 years that provides individuals with a right to access their own records. But exercising that right has historically been quite frustrating, or at least often been quite frustrating. Uh, often it has involved going down to a medical records department and signing papers or sending faxes and getting a stack of paper out the other end of the process. Uh, and in the context of those kinds of, let's say, traditional medical records requests, there's often a cost associated as well. Those costs are, are limited and the Office for Civil Rights under uh, Health and Human Services has set very clear guidelines around how much you can charge, it comes back to time and materials to produce those results, but ultimately they wind up being kind of a price per page. And so patients with long or complex medical histories wound up paying more to get access to those things. Uh, and what we've seen under the current wave of regulations is a drive towards providing that availability in a free way, in an online way, where consumers can connect an app of their choice uh, to those data. Uh, and I'm gonna give you a slide from the Office of the National Coordinator. This is tied back to the Cures Act final rule. So these are the rules that came out last year, just to give you a quick sense of the regulatory timelines. Um, and we'll refer back to some of these deadlines as we go through the rest of the themes. But the overall picture here is the ONC is in charge of putting together rules for uh, providing information access, driving into some of the business requirements to make sure that information flows when it's supposed to, and also some of the technical requirements to talk about uh, the standards and the interoperability APIs that make these data available. And I'm gonna highlight just a few of the deadlines uh, in this timeline to give you a sense of how things are evolving. 
So first of all, already this year in the kind of April 2021 timeframe, we have some compliance requirements coming online, which effectively say that uh, healthcare providers can't be doing what's called information blocking. Uh, and that is to say information is supposed to flow to any authorized user unless one of a certain limited number of exceptions is met. And if there's interest, we can drill into those exceptions, uh, but it provides a very strong framework where the baseline is sharing, and then there could be some reasons not to share. So those are some policy requirements that have already come online. But as we get, dig into the technical requirements, uh, these are things that are coming online at the end of next year and a little later. So one of them is Fire API access. And this works at the individual level. So individuals can hook apps of their choice up to an EHR. And it also works at the population level so that health systems can do a data export across all the patients in their EHR or across a group or population of patients in that EHR system. And those are APIs that are coming online by the end of next year. Although many vendors already have support for these APIs in production today. And we'll talk a little bit about current state. And then the third thing that I wanted to highlight on this slide is end of 2023. And this is where a requirement called EHI export comes into play. Uh, and we'll talk more about the details, but EHI export is really about all the stuff that we don't know how to standardize today. So the stuff that's not necessarily part of a core record or a summary record, but the long tail of data that might live inside of an EHR and be really important for sense making um, or for an individual who wants to get access to their full history. So those are just a few of the, the deadlines to give you a sense of how the policy and the technology is playing out all inside of this regulatory framework. Now, when we talk about data access, a lot of the, the, the critical needs come down to workflow. And so what we saw maybe five or six years ago in the stage of our meaningful use stage two regulations was there were requirements to share data with consumers, but the workflows were quite manual and quite different from system to system. So if you look back at the 2014 electronic uh, health record certification program, there was this central concept of VDT, view, download, and transmit. And the idea here was that a patient portal in order to support these regulatory requirements would provide options for a consumer to view their own healthcare data, to download a copy of those data in the form of an XML document, a clinical summary document, um, and the ability to request that those data be transmitted to a third party. The challenge was that every portal looked and felt pretty different. And even if the XML files were fairly well standardized, the workflow for finding one was challenging. And then once you download one of those files, how do you manage to save it and, and make use of it downstream? Consumers were really the ones who had to shoulder all that burden. And when it came to the transmit capability, uh, there was a real missed opportunity here because Every system had this ability to fire off these secure emails that patients could trigger from inside the portal, but the network of providers really didn't offer good connectivity. So it was very hard to know if your information actually got sent or if there might've been some kind of error along the way. And a common workflow for consumers would be to say, you know, I wanna send this data to Dr. Smith and click the send button inside their portal. And they would get a message back saying, we have attempted to send your message to Dr. Smith. Please follow up with them to see if it worked. And, and that would be kind of the end of the story. And most of the time it, it didn't work or consumers couldn't really find uh, the place to begin that workflow in the first place. And this speaks to the importance of details in these regulations. Uh, you typically get what you ask for. And if what you specify is a view download transmit mechanism, then you'll get lots of implementations of that mechanism. And in the US, we've got hundreds of EHR systems that are certified under these rules from the Office of the National Coordinator for Health IT. So that means hundreds on the order of 500 different interpretations of those rules with implementations that all vary. So one of the goals in the most recent round of rulemaking is to provide access to data, not just as a place where patients can sign into a portal and download those data, but to guide consumers through a workflow of plugging their data into an app of their choice. Uh, and a great example of apps in this space would be some of the consumer facing personal health records, things like Apple Health, which includes health records functionality, or uh, on Android, the Common Health Project, where individual consumers can connect those apps to their records in potentially several different health systems and bring together an aggregated view of their own records onto their phone. Uh, but nothing about this needs to be mobile centric. Nothing about this is limited to native OS specific 
uh, apps. So I wanna give you an example, just to, to give you a sense of this guided and automated workflow of connecting an app to an EHR system. So this is an app called Procure that was developed by uh, my colleague, Dan Gottlieb, working with me on the Sync for Science project at Harvard uh, DBMI. And I should have made this an HTTPS link, although I think it'll work about the same either way. Just to give you a sense of workflow, this is designed as a tool that research studies can stand up kind of out of the box to take advantage of some of these EHR data collection workflows, really putting the research participant or the patient at the center of the sharing workflow. And this is kind of a, a guided step-by-step -step process in this mode that will take a research participant or a patient through the steps of collecting their EHR from several sources. Uh, and so this example, I'll show you what it looks like to connect to a sandbox environment from the Cerner EHR. And they have a couple of different sandboxes in Cerner and in Epic. Some of them require you to sign in um, and some of them are just open sandboxes. And for the purposes of this demo, I'll connect to the open sandboxes. But in a, in a real life scenario, when I click login here, I would be presented with a Cerner or an Epic login screen. And I would click a button saying, yes, I want to share my data with this Procure app. Um, and you could repeat the process to connect to different providers, maybe inside of different health systems, because the reality is that health records are fragmented today. You can connect to as many providers as you need to, to bring your records together. And then as a consumer, you can download a copy of these data as a, a zip file, and that'll give you access to the full set of fire resources, something that's not gonna be that relevant for most consumers, but for power users or programmers who wanna really dig in and understand what's going on, that kind of transparency is really important. And the other thing that you can do is uh, if, Procure is configured in this way to proceed by uploading your data to a specific research project. So in this context, we called it the test project. Uh, and this would take you on a flow to you know, successfully uploading your data to that project. Um, the other thing to highlight in this app is that not only does it take you through the sort of wizard mode, but if you want to, it also includes um, a full web UI for browsing um, all of the records right in the web browser and getting details about how many API requests have been issued and how many different fire resources um, have been retrieved. And you can go through in full detail and see all of those data. So that's sort of for the, the geeks in the audience, a view at what's happening under the hood beyond the wizard mode. The important story here for consumers is that you can connect any app of your choice uh, to these health records and you've got a guided workflow. So you don't have to start from scratch portal by portal and try to navigate to the screens where this functionality is buried. Instead, the app can take you right through that process and you sign into the portal only for the purpose of approving access to those apps. Now, when we dig into the concept of what data are being shared, uh, there's an evolution here. And the regulatory constructs that we've put in place today are very much focused on what's called a core data set or a summary data set. And this is embodied in, uh, in our regulations, which point to this idea of a USCDI, a core data for interoperability. Uh, and the idea here is this more or less reflects the things that we know how to standardize as an industry. The things that are widely available using open standards today, things like medications, problems, allergies, procedures, uh, smoking history, um, certain aspects of, of family history perhaps, um, and most recently added to this is the idea of a set of clinical notes. This doesn't necessarily mean every clinical note in an EHR, but it's defined by category to say that things like consultation notes, discharge summaries, lab reports, pathology reports, imaging narrative, all these categories of notes are included in the core data set. So even if the, the free text content of these notes isn't fully specified and standardized, the wrapper around the notes is standardized. So you can tell who wrote it and when it was written and what general category of note it is. And then once you drill into the actual uh, content of the note, you might get free text. And so the US core data set is something that reflects what we know how to standardize today. And it's designed to grow over time. So already you can see that the regulations today refer to version one, but we have a draft available of version two. And this becomes a community effort year over year to say, what new kinds of data can we add to the set? What are the things that uh, we've been working on from a standards perspective and that we're confident adding to the core data set over time? So you can see that one of the things that's, that's included in the second draft for the US core data set would be like 
encounter information. Uh, where did an encounter take place? What type of encounter was it? When did it happen? Those kinds of details, which uh, in fact are quite well standardized today, but weren't part of the original release. Those are draft content in the US core data set version two. So the regulatory focus is defining this core data set and growing it over time. Uh, but the truth is that the, the denominator, the full set of EHR data is also growing over time uh, as clinical science improves and as new methodologies of data collection uh, are developed, we've got a moving target in terms of standardizing what goes into an EHR. And so the regulations also recognize this by defining this concept called EHI export or electronic health information export. And this is really about everything else, the things that aren't part of the core data set and might never be part of the core data set, or at least it might be a long while. Uh, and so the idea here is Every certified EHR system needs to have a way of doing this EHI export by the end of 2023. Uh, and there are no formal standards around the export data formats because these are things we don't know how to standardize by definition, but there are strong guidelines around the principles. And so an EHR that's doing this kind of export can't collapse data into free text, for example, if the data are managed in a structured way in the underlying EHR. So if you manage structured data, you need to be able to export structured data. And then each electronic health record system can document the structures and the formats of its own exports. And there may be differences system to system. In fact, I think there, there almost certainly will be differences, but this gives developers and integrators um, a target that they'll be able to use for accessing the full set of data that goes beyond what's available in our core data set. And it's a great way to kind of collapse some of the challenges of standardization with the real world pragmatics of just give me the damn data and I'll make sense of it on the other side. So a few more notes about data standardization. Um, I, I mentioned that we've got these APIs that we call out that are based on FHIR, fast healthcare inf information resources. And the idea in the core FHIR specification is that these are international standards. So if we look at FHIR release four from HL7, there are at this point over 150 different resources or data models that FHIR defines. Uh, and they're a great starting point for making sense of clinical data. And they include administrative resources like patients and practitioners and organizations. And they include clinical resources like allergy intolerances and observations and procedure lists. But at the level of these core FHIR specifications, there is very little in the way of data requirements. So for example, the FHIR patient resource um, has many different data elements or attributes that can be attached to it, but they're effectively all optional. And there's many different kinds of data that can be coded, but typically at the level of the standard, FHIR leaves the code systems or the value sets wide open. And the reason for this is that FHIR is an international standard, and we only include constraints in it if we can get very broad international agreement across all use cases. Uh, and so the assessment goes, like, if there's a use case for the patient resource where we don't have a name, then the cardinality of a name needs to leave name as optional. And that's very useful in terms of making sure these, these resource definitions can be used in a variety of contexts, but it can be maddening from an integration perspective if you have nothing firm to stand on. And so what we do is develop a set of regional or use case specific profiles like Fire US Core. And here what, what happens is that the community uh, in the US looks at the requirements coming from OMC for that US Core data set, and looks at the FHIR profiles that are published at the international level. And then we provide one more layer of detail. So for example, um, on the patient resource, we'll go ahead and say, there are some fields that are gonna be required um, in the context of US data exchange, even though they're optional at the base level of the international FHIR standard. So we say there must be an identifier and a name and uh, an administrative gender. Sometimes we'll layer on additional data elements. So for example, the, the core fire patient resource doesn't have any notion of race or ethnicity or birth sex, but these are requirements in the US core. And so we can layer on extensions to the fire data models to lock down these kinds of details. Uh, and we can also provide value sets. So for example, in the context of lab results or vital sign observations uh, in the US core, we can lock those down to LOINC codings to say there's a, 
preferred or an extensible vocabulary binding uh, for those kinds of resources. And, and so this is how we can layer constraints onto these information models to make it easier to work with these data downstream. And the last theme that I wanna to touch on here with respect to consumer access is how do we manage permissions? And the way that we've gotten started here is when you're sharing your data with an app, you can choose to share the full contents of a patient record. So everything that you're allowed to see, you delegate permission to that app, or you can do it sort of fire resource type by resource type. So you might say, I wanna share my patient demographics and my immunization records, but I don't wanna share observations. And that's what we've launched in the, what we call the smart app framework. But that's oftentimes a bit coarse grained. Uh, so maybe you don't wanna share all the observations in a cl clinical record, but you just wanna share height and weight information for a growth chart application that's gonna plot those details over time. The FHIR um, observation resource is actually used for quite a few things, including vital signs, lab results, social history. Some of those could be quite sensitive data. Uh, and so the idea here is how can we provide a, a language of scopes or permissions that allow sharing to be more granular? And this is work in progress. We haven't um, published this update to the smart app launch specification, uh, but this is the work that we have today moving through the standards process where we can not only name a fire resource type, like I wanna share my observations, but we can also attach um, search parameters that restrict exactly what's being shared. So I can say, I wanna share observations where the category is vital signs or where the sensitivity is moderate or low. Those are the kinds of additional caveats or constraints that can be attached to these data scopes. Uh, and this could be useful when you're sharing data with an app that you don't trust that much. So maybe when you're running your own personal health record app on your mobile phone that you control, you're willing to share everything and you don't need to get into all this fine grained permission stuff. But if you're sharing data with um, let's say an insurance adjustment app or a disability app that's gonna help evaluate a claim that you've made, you might only wanna share a restricted set of data. So it's useful to be able to express these kinds of limitations uh, in the permission language or in the scope language. I'll say there are some real implementation challenges here. The complexity of describing arbitrary subsets of the record in a way that makes sense to consumers and can also be implemented in a performant way at scale. Uh, this is in a lot of ways untrodden territory. So we're working on a few of the basics here, uh, but we're also looking for feedback from the community. Before I switch gears then uh, and move on from consumer access to some of the themes in research, let me just pause and see if there's questions um, up to this point um, any clarifications or, or topics that folks wish I would have dug into on the consumer access side? If not, let's push ahead and talk a little bit about uh, the research theme. So one clear message that I wanna share with the research community uh, is to think about some of these standards in terms of data and workflows as a way to bring more EHR data into research studies. So we got some early experience on this theme, working with the All of Us Research Project in an NIH funded effort. So this is part of the, the All of Us Research Program um, where all of us have many different ways of collecting data from research participants. Some of them involve hospital-based recruitment, where there's maybe on the order of a dozen different recruitment sites around the country. And those sites bring members of their patient population into the study and take them through a data collection workflow. And those sites have uh, information technology staff who are funded to do data extracts from their EHRs and format them, uh, in this case, into an OMOP database format and submit those data to a centralized study management platform. Uh, and that is what I would call kind of the organization-centric route of data transfer. And it can be very powerful, but it's also quite expensive. And it's limited to just the organizations that are part of the network. And I think this will be a familiar theme for folks in this community as well, is you, you build up these research networks, you get buy-in early on, um, and then each site needs to do the, the heavy lifting of curating the data. Sometimes those sites submit the data to a central repository. Sometimes they manage a federated query architecture uh, where they can do the analysis and just share the results. But it's very significant work for each site to be able to deploy and maintain that infrastructure. At the same time, the All of Us program has invested in another route of data exchange, which is the consumer-centric route. 
Just like the example I showed you with Procure, uh, the All of Us research uh, program has piloted applications that run on iOS or Android that do all kinds of consumer data collection, including surveys and other tools, but that also use these smart on fire APIs as a mechanism of bringing data in. And of course, one benefit there is it breaks down some of the organizational barriers. You're not limited to just bringing data in from clinical providers who are part of your study network, but you can bring data in from any clinical provider that has a certified EHR and has turned on these regulated uh, API capabilities. So that becomes a very powerful and, and quite general purpose mechanism for bringing data into your research study. It certainly doesn't replace the kind of work that happens institution by institution in network building, but it's a powerful complement and it takes advantage of some off the shelf capabilities that are part of these systems. Uh, another theme here is that the FIRE APIs can also be used for things like data collection, whether it's from consumer devices or surveys. Uh, FIRE provides data models for all these kinds of things. And if you're building a research study, taking advantage of some of these data models rather than designing a set of one-off models for your study uh, can be quite helpful. So you won't necessarily get these data from inside of a certified EHR, uh, but if you're targeting these kinds of, of data, these resource definitions become a really nice starting point. So we've seen device resources being used to model things like consumer facing blood pressure or glucometers. Um, and also we'll get to this in a little bit. We've also seen the device resource used to describe things like software devices and machine learning algorithms so that you can track versioning and model information with some construct that you can point back to from your results. So you know, oh, this risk assessment was issued or generated by a particular version of a particular algorithm. So there are resources like device and also resources like the questionnaire and questionnaire response, which provide a, a quite powerful mechanism of representing in a standardized way, nested and structured questionnaires that individuals can fill out uh, and that might be used in the context of clinical care or in the context of uh, research survey data instruments. And there's a lot of machinery being built around these FIRE questionnaire and questionnaire response formats. Uh, and so these are useful things to know about from a research perspective to say, if I'm interested in driving data collection, uh, this might be a really powerful intermediate model to be able to populate to say, here's my questionnaire, and I might hand this off to many different kinds of tools that would help consumers fill out those details. Um, but the structure of the questionnaire and the response can be standardized and, and FIRE provides you know, quite a lot uh, in that regard. I will also note that while most of the regulatory focus uh, in terms of smart on FIRE data access has been about pulling data out of the EHR or getting access to data from an EHR, there's also a very important theme about putting data back into EHRs. And these could be uh, individual surveys that people fill out at home, or they could be device data like glucose readings or even step counts that happen um, outside of the clinical visit. And there's a lot of work happening in this space. Uh, all right, maybe the HL7 website will be down. Uh, but I wanted to point to one project that's launched in a standard acceleration group called the Argonaut Project. Uh, which involves electronic health record vendors and clinical provider organizations coming together to expand the standards that we've got. Uh, and so this year we've got a focus on writing data back into EHRs, particularly around some of these at-home device data, as well as surveys or questionnaires. Uh, and the idea here is by working with some of the EHR vendors, develop a core set of APIs uh, that could really unlock a lot of use cases downstream. And I wanted to highlight this as an active project open for community participation. So if this is interesting to you, there's links in the slides uh, that can help you get started or, or get involved in these kinds of projects. Just as bringing consumer data from personal health records back into the EHR is important, these same kinds of techniques can be applied with respect to uh, research data for things like risk assessments or scores. Another really important theme for these uh, APIs and for these FIRE data models comes down to uh, cohort creation and potentially recruitment for clinical trials or for care coordination programs within a health system. So this could be everything from which part, which patients in my health system are eligible to participate in a given trial, or who are the patients in my population who might have poorly controlled diabetes, who might be eligible for a diabetes management program that's going to put them on a better track. Um, and I wanted to highlight a couple things here. One is the idea of doing complex and rich data analysis directly on top of 
the fire data models. And so as more and more EHR systems become capable of exporting fire at scale, we talked about these population level data uh, export APIs that can give you information on the whole US core data set across a population of patients, you get large files with data extracts in them. And then the question is, well, what do you do? One thing you can do is load them into your data analysis machinery of choice, map them into uh, your existing analytics infrastructure and run with it. But it's also increasingly possible to use those fire export files as a direct target of analytics tools. So Spark SQL is a great example. And the team at Cerner has built an open source layer on top of Spark SQL called Bunsen uh, that can give you some really nice ergonomics for doing things like joining clinical data against standardized value sets. Uh, but this lets you get into the rich sort of nested and complex data structures that FHIR defines. Uh, they often go beyond kind of just a simple table of observations that gets into the links uh, between and the observation and sample and specimen collection and healthcare providers who might have ordered a given uh, observation to be made. And the fire data, data models surface a lot of those details and you can start to write uh, rich SQL queries that join across these different data sets uh, and can do sort of arbitrarily interesting things uh, that are backed by potentially a cluster of, of compute that you spin up uh, to be able to support those queries. Uh, there's a very similar model in some of the cloud hosted uh, fire analytics environments. So for example, in the Google environment, there's a story for loading these kinds of bulk fire data into BigQuery or in the Microsoft environment, there's a story for loading these into um, Databricks to be able to run these queries against what could just be flat files of fire data sitting in a cloud bucket somewhere. Uh, and there's a really nice story for, for sharing those kinds of analyses over the SQL data. I will say that the tooling is still much less mature in this environment than it is for some of the dedicated uh, clinical analytics tools. Uh, but it's a really interesting area from my perspective uh, because it opens up a lot of possibilities without having to do heavy data mapping. So that's a little bit about looking at piles of data within an organization. Uh, but I also wanna call out the power of these capabilities for managing the data across organizations as well. And so coming online by the end of next year, I mentioned the requirement for bulk data export or population level APIs. And this is just sort of a, a, a teaser that gives you a sense of how these APIs work. Uh, but the basic concept is any EHR that supports the certification requirements provides a way to kick off uh, an export job. And so I might take, uh, you know, as an example, uh, a simple app that's going to kick off an export job. You can say which kinds of resources you're interested in. So you could say, you know, I'm interested in all the different fire resources or just some subset of them. And when you kick off an export job, there is a standard that takes you through the process uh, of saying, here's the different data that I want to export. The server managing the export might take its time to get this job done. So it's an asynchronous process uh, of managing this kind of uh, data export. And the application that kicks off the export can learn eventually when that process is complete and then gets a list of links to different files that it can download, each one uh, a, a rich or full set of fire data of a particular type. So you might have lots of files full of observations, for example, that tends to be one of the, the largest data sets inside of um, a fire data export. So that's just a little bit on the theme of managing data within and across organizations uh, at scale. I also want to say just a couple of things about data set curation. I think this is an increasing theme of using FHIR as an intermediate target inside of research studies to say we might be getting data from many places. In some cases, uh, proprietary native EHR exports. In some case, FHIR native uh, EHR access. In some cases, data extraction from a natural language processing pipeline. But by using FHIR as an intermediary representation in a machine learning pipeline, you can normalize uh, those different resources uh, into a standard set of FHIR data models. And this provides not only a template to work against, but a template that is rich with some of the semantics that are really important in research, handling things like timestamps associated with these different resources. So the timestamp at which a specimen was collected versus analyzed versus when the result landed and was available for a clinician, uh, it's really important to get those timestamps on the operational details right for certain kinds of machine learning tasks, um, like prediction, 
in the context of a hospital workflow, uh, you want to make sure you're not taking a sneak peek at information from the future uh, when you're training your prediction model. And so FIRE provides a number of, of building blocks that make that process uh, a little bit easier to manage. I want to say a couple things about surfacing research results back into the clinical workflow. Uh, so first of all is the opportunity to use EHR embedded applications that can be put right inside of a, a frame inside of the EHR uh, for clinicians to see. And so there's a great example of this that Apple announced um, at their developer conference just this, uh, this month to say, you can take personal health record data that are managed on an iPhone and inject a window into the EHR that can show activity, step trackers, uh, menstrual cycles, all the different information that might be captured or tracked inside of Apple health records. Now consumers can be in control of deciding what to share back with a clinician. And the clinician can see that view embedded right into their existing workflow. A very similar approach can be taken for research results to say, if you've got a way of calculating a risk score or visualizing um, diagnostic possibilities, you can surface that right back in the clinical workflow by using the smart app integration capability. And similarly, sometimes there are use cases where you know a clinician's not going to specifically navigate to your app. Maybe it's not relevant all the time, um, but you want to surface some information like a risk score just in the cases where it matters. So clinical decision support hooks is an example of a project in that space. Uh, and I won't go into it just for reasons of time, but this is the kind of technology that can be applied both for surfacing research results like risk scores, but also for meeting things like regulatory requirements in terms of taking a clinician through a decision process to order the best imaging study given clinical guidelines uh, in, a, in a specific patient scenario. So CDS hooks is another important capability for surfacing those results in a workflow. Um, and then finally, I'll just mention that FIRE provides a set of resources for modeling research studies themselves. Uh, and these are early days still, but resources like the participant and the research study can describe things like structured eligibility requirements. So if you're managing a set of studies and you want a place to capture metadata, FIRE provides some of that as well. I will say that those resources are, are still pretty early on the maturity trajectory. It's worth taking a look at if you've got needs in this space. But it also calls for me one of the risks in this sort of overarching fire story, which is the scope of these standards continues to grow. There's many different communities coming together to the table at HL7 to work on fire. But as the scope of the standard increases, there's often tension between the needs of different sub communities and the timescales on which development is happening. Uh, and this is one of the, the biggest challenges at the community level is how do we keep the specification iterating and improving over time, particularly for the low maturity areas that need rapid cycling, but also how do we maintain stability over time, particularly for areas like the US core resources where we've got widespread implementation today. So that's a bit from the research perspective. And I'll leave you with just a couple of thoughts looking ahead to what I see as some of the unsolved challenges in the healthcare space. One of them has to do with this concept of seamlessly bringing together patient records from many different healthcare provider organizations so that you've got a comprehensive record in front of you when you're making decisions or understanding a patient's history, or so patients themselves can get access to this full data set and manage it on their own. Uh, we've had a lot of federal investment in one particular architecture over the last decade or more, which is the idea of a national exchange network where mostly providers can look up information by broadcasting a query out to different health systems to say, hey, I've got a patient in front of me with this name and this birth date. Do you have any records about them? And there are some real challenges to making this work at scale. Some of them are technical, managing things like false positives and false negatives and managing expectations. Some of these are policy challenges, like deciding the different use cases under which you want to allow these access, these kinds of access, or when and how it's safe to actually give patients access to these systems. And I think for a lot of clinicians, the story on the ground has been that these national data exchange networks still aren't working that well, even if by the numbers uh, we see the, the quantities going up month over month or year over year. I think this is this to me feels like a perpetual challenge. And fundamentally, I think the model itself uh, raises some real questions around things like identity management, uh, but it continues to be a strong regulatory push from the US side. And the last theme that I'll leave you with has to do with more and more consumer controlled data stores over time. 
So how do we give individuals access to their records, not just so that they can keep a copy, but so they can have a verifiable copy that they can share downstream in a trustworthy way. And we know that the details haven't been tampered with. Uh, and so there's been ongoing work here, particularly motivated by some of the COVID use cases like sharing vaccine records, but we've done this with a, a careful eye towards keeping it general purpose. So we're not limited to just things like vaccine records or COVID-19 lab tests. Um, so I included in the slides here, a link to the work that we've done on the smart health cards framework as one point in that design space uh, for consumer controlled, verifiable data stores. So that's a little bit looking ahead uh, and a bit of a summary of where we are right now for consumer access and for research. Let me pause there and see if we've got time to open up for questions. Happy to dig into any areas that would be interesting to the group. Hey, Josh, it's Diane. First of all, I want to really thank you for, for joining us. I thought that was really terrific. Um, I have more of a comment than a question, but I, you know, as a, as a person who's worked in healthcare IT for well over 30 years. <laughs> um, this is just like almost magical. It's just like exciting. Um, but I also think about, you know, one of the earlier talks that we had today was uh, from Kavi, who, who spent a good part of uh, the pandemic in India and the fact that they don't even have basic, basic, basic infrastructure in place to count patients. So I, you know, I'm kind of torn with the foundation. You know, I definitely, we've got to move into to fire because that's what we need to do to, to really enhance and move forward. But sometimes just the simple, the simple things need to be done as well to, to expand this, you know, across the world that really needs it. Totally agree. Um, and you know, there's, there's also some really interesting architectural uh, decisions and an architectural um, foundation that's being laid in places that haven't previously had um, let's say, historical health information exchange at the national level. So the, the India health stack work that's, that's being developed today is, is a really interesting model that puts consumers in control with this idea of a consent manager in the center of the system. So that as new sites start to come online, the idea is I might register my own consent manager. So every place I receive care will check in with that consent manager and say, here's some new data. And that can broadcast out notifications to the different data sources that I've configured it with. And those are architectures that I think are very powerful in the long term. And they can be very hard to steer towards in the context of an organization or in the context of something like the US national system, where we've got such an entrenched investment in certain kinds of data networks. Uh, but I, I think that kind of consumer centric network becomes a real opportunity in places that haven't already laid that groundwork. We have a question from Matt B. I'm going to unmute you, Matt B, and you can ask your question. Thank you, Diane. Thank you, Josh, for an excellent, uh, excellent talk. I absolutely love the overview of the uh, of the spectrum. Uh, the question I wanted to ask is is about a potential paywall that uh, EMR vendors may or may not put up in front of these Fire APIs when they become available. Uh, these days. They do have API level access to the to the back end of their systems, but they try to charge probably an insignificant, I mean a not insignificant amount of money. So you know, like every call, every patient, uh, and it really adds up. What is your take on on that probability in the future and how will this work? Yeah. So in terms of the regulations that we have coming online today, there are some clear protections. Uh, against these kinds of paywalls. Uh, one is for consumer access. When I'm hooking up an app of my choice to my health records in an EHR system, that's free for me and for the app developer. So there's, there's not like a, uh, an API cost associated with connecting my own apps. Um, that's a really important baseline because it opens up access to individuals who might otherwise not have a, an easy way to afford it. When it comes to clinician facing apps that run within a health system, um, there might be charges for those apps, but there's very clear constraints put in place that those charges need to be cost-based, so they can't be sort of arbitrary business negotiations, and they need to be consistent across different apps. So it can't be like, well, I see you're providing a high-value app, so I'm going to charge you a, a high amount, and somebody else is providing an app that's you know, relatively low value, so I'll charge them less. Uh, the model is that it needs to be basically utility pricing. 
And so that's another really powerful aspect of the rules that we have in place. All of that said, those rules apply to the standardized APIs, the, the stuff that, that comes off the shelf for access to core data sets. When vendors go above and beyond to provide kind of value added services, there the cost model could be quite different. So I'm still interested to see how this plays out, but I think we've got a couple of fundamental protections in place that should help a lot. Sean, go ahead. So uh, first of all, thanks for an outstanding talk, Josh. I mean, that was so comprehensive and so action packed. I have to say it was just amazing. Okay. Now I have to say, but though I'm, I'm pondering the following. So uh, fire has been out for a while. It's a little bit like, you know, the, the kind of uh, descriptive framework that came out, you know, RDF from, you know, the 2000s, right? And at that time, they kind of promised us that there would be a query mechanism and they put out some sparkle things and so forth that presumably were going to be able to query, but they were so slow, it never worked, right? And I'm, I'm worried that fire is going to fall into the same bin because, you know, when you get to billions and billions of records, I've seen a lot of projects spin up, try to do it, and either fail or just never be, been heard from again. So what is your opinion about that? Because the problem is that, you know, when we get billions of records that we need to search, we just can't do with something that isn't a high performance kind of solution. Great question. Um, and, and I might divide it into two parts. So first of all, I think the core value proposition for FIRE and the thing that I try to highlight first is data access. So here, you know, how do I get data out of a system in a consistent way? Um, and that could be for the individual or at the population level for a health system. FIRE provides a common building block to do data query and export. And those queries aren't necessarily sophisticated, right? It's give me all the data about Sean, or give me all the observations about Josh. Um, and so there, executing those queries doesn't require a lot of sophistication. It's just a way to get data out. Now, on the other side, you've got a pile of fire data. How do you want to evaluate it from an analytics perspective? And here, you know, I'm a lot less dogmatic. I don't think this needs to be standardized. And so like one thing you can do with the data is load it into an IPv2 instance that's highly optimized for a specific uh, query pattern that you know you want to execute and run with it. And that's like a perfectly great thing to do. When I highlight things like SQL on fire as sort of interesting and exciting areas, um, I think they deserve attention. But one of the key questions is how well do they scale? Um, and I think this is a place where we should be pushing on um, some of the generic cloud service providers uh, with these kinds of questions. But the semantics of writing SQL over a pile of nested fire data, where you've got references from observations to patients to practitioners, the semantics there are very powerful. And the scaling story for things like Spark SQL are, you know, the story is quite good, but at the same time, you've got to look at the specific analyses you want to run and the costs that it takes to run them and compare those with your alternatives. So I don't think this is necessarily a silver bullet, but I think it's actually, a, it's a new point in the design space that's worth exploring. Thanks, Josh. Kavi, you can unmute yourself. I think you had a question. Yeah. Hey, Josh. Uh, always great to hear from you. Uh, I, I worry about uh, the complexity of fire. You know, uh, like uh, so. You you worked on you know on I two B two apps or Spart apps before fire came, and how complex it was to develop an app at that time, and and the complexity now. Do you think? Uh, I know. So at, at the core of a fire resource is nothing but a, the code system. And fire kind of says, okay, the code system is, can you can define what the code system is. So I feel that before fire came into the picture, the focus was more on the coding systems, getting the semantics right there. And fire is kind of taking the attention away. You know, uh, so to summarize my question, what is the value of thinking of head data as just a combination of code value pairs which I to be do things as th things of data as versus putting them in a you know elaborate packet, you know uh, as a resource which fire organizes. Sure. Uh, so I mean, first of all, I also worry about the complexity of fire, and I think one of the challenges is just the broad scope of the standard. But if we focus on things like 
the resources needed for US core data access. Um, I think the, the story is a lot better. Uh, and indeed, it allows us to have exactly those conversations about vocabulary in a way that is specific to narrow problems. So I can talk about you know, how consistently can we code allergies in the context of US healthcare without having to cross up that conversation with you know, other, other attributes like coding the severity of an allergy. We can just talk about the allergen in isolation. Uh, I think what your question is really getting at has historically been called the, the term info problem. You know, how much do you put in your terminology model, like a SNOMED or a LOINC, and how much do you put in your information model, like a fire allergy or a fire observation? Uh, and you know, this might just be sort of one of those spectra where you know, there, are, there are a few different efficient points on that curve, but I think FIRE does a very practical job of defining that information model so we can have the terminology questions in the specific slots uh, where it matters. If you try to boil the entire record down to just a pile of codes, the challenge is every one of those things has a context um, and getting across where those boundaries are is difficult. It's, it's a little bit of an abstract answer, but I, I think that fire resources like allergy intolerance or observation or condition do a good job of providing a framework of data elements and then pushing into the vocabularies the key bits like which allergen or which clinical problem. 